Toward the end of his life, the Buddha gave a list of the seven most important teachings he had left behind that he wanted the monks and other lay followers to continue to practice in order to keep the Dharma alive. And on the list was the four bases of success. Nowadays you hardly hear any reference to this list at all. This may be due to the fact that in modern Dharma, mindfulness practice and concentration practice have been separated. Concentration has been downplayed, and the four bases of success deal directly with concentration. And when you look at the list of qualities that are included under the four bases of success, you find only one that's emphasized in modern mindfulness. That's intentness. The other three, desire, effort, using your powers of judgment. These are all considered bad things to be doing when you meditate. But they are a necessary part of concentration, and also really a necessary part of mindfulness, as the Buddha taught it. And so if you want to succeed at your meditation, and the Buddha was very unabashed about talking about succeeding in meditation, the fact that there are good meditations and bad meditations, and you want to work toward the good and succeed at doing your meditation well, it's good to know these qualities. The Buddha describes them as four types of concentration. There's concentration based on desire and the fabrications of, of exertion. There's concentration based on effort and the fabrications of exertion. There's concentration based on intent and the fabrications of exertion. And finally, the concentration based on vimangsa, a polytrum that has many meanings in English. It can be your powers of judgment. The Thais like to translate it as circumspection. It can mean powers of analysis your ingenuity. In other words, the active part of the mind that likes to figure things out, together with the fabrications of exertion. Even though it sounds like four different types of concentration, it's more in a matter of emphasis, because you're going to need all four qualities, desire, effort, intent, and your powers of judgment, your circumspection, for the concentration to go well. In other words, you have to want to do it, and you have to put in some effort. You have to be really intent on what you're doing, pay careful attention. Ajahn Sawat would emphasize this point a lot. He says, don't just go through the motions, really pay attention to what you're doing, what's coming out as a result. And then use your powers of judgment to figure out what's going well, what's not going well. For instance, with the breath. It's good to remind yourself of why you want to be with the breath. It is the force of life. And of the elements of the body, it's the most responsive to the mind. If you want to sit here for long periods of time, it's good to be able to play with the breath, to get the rest of the body into a state where it's pleasant to be here. So look at your breathing. We're here not for the sake of the breath, we're here to use the breath for a higher purpose. But learn how to transfer your desire for that higher purpose to the causes that will get you there. In this case, it's being with the breath, wanting to be with the breath. The more comfortable you can make the breath, the easier it will be to want to stay here. And if it's not comfortable, then you use your effort. Try longer breathing, shorter breathing, fast breathing, slow breathing, deep, shallow. At the same time, use effort on the mind. If the mind is wandering off, you bring it right back. If it wanders off again, you bring it right back again. You've got to show the mind that you mean business. Otherwise, it'll clock in and then go off and 
sleep under a tree someplace. So look at your mind. What skillful things are coming up right now? And how can you encourage them? As for unskillful things, how do you put them aside? This is where the fabrications of exertion come in. It's a technical term. Basically, it refers to three kinds of fabrication bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily is the breath, verbal, is the way you talk to yourself. In the Buddhist terms, it's direct a thought and evaluation. And the mental has to do with perceptions and feelings. Perceptions are the images by which the mind communicates with itself, either pictures or single words. And the feelings are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And these things all respond to your intentions. And they have an impact on how you experience the body, how you experience the mind. This is why they're essential to all four types of concentration. So if the mind is wandering off, you ask yourself, how am I breathing right now? Is that aggravating things so that it makes the mind want to wander off? Or if anger has already taken hold of the mind, greed has taken, fear has taken hold of the mind, what have they done to the breath? Can you consciously get it back? They've appropriated your breath from you. You can, you can seize it back. As for verbal fabrication, how are you talking to yourself? There's talking to yourself about how much you don't like this, you don't like that. You can ask yourself, is this a worthwhile use of your time? When you're angry at somebody, as I say, it's like you're picking up a hot coal to throw at them. Well, you've already picked up the hot coal. It's already burning your hand. See if you can think about the issue in other ways. Someone who's done something you don't like, you can look at for things that they may have done that are actually good. So it can give rise to a sense of goodwill toward that person. And then an attitude of goodwill allows you to put the issue down, and you can get back to the breath. As for mental fabrication, well, that image of the burning coal, it's a perception. It's a useful perception to develop. You can look at what kind of perceptions you have that are aggravating the mind and making it want to wander off, and see if you can replace them with perceptions that are more conducive to wanting to stay. You can sit here thinking about all the things that are wrong right now, wrong with your body, wrong with the situation around you. And what you succeed in doing is making yourself miserable for the hour. Or you can focus on the things that are right. The weather's cool. Things are quiet. You have no responsibilities at the moment. And you get back to the breath. So you look at how the mind is fabricating problems for itself and realizing that it is a matter of fabrication. You don't have to put things together in that way. You can put things together in another way. That's what's meant by the fabrications of exertion. They're most directly related, as I said, to the basis of success, related to effort. But they relate to all the other ones as well. Now, there's one you want to be intent on the breath. How do you talk to yourself to make yourself really interested in what's going on, really interested in what you're doing? So you can give it your full attention. After all, here we are in the present moment, the same place where the Buddha gained awakening, watching our breath, the same thing he was watching. So what's the difference? 
The difference is he was paying careful, careful attention both to his breath and to his mind. And when you pay careful attention, we're going to see. You're going to see things that are going well and things that are not going to go well. You have to learn how to judge the difference. That's what the fourth base of success is all about. But it doesn't stop simply with passing judgment. You're passing judgment the same way that a carpenter would pass judgment on a, say, a piece of furniture that he's working on. You're judging a work in progress. You play in the wood, and you say, whoops, there's a neck. Or you played it unevenly. Well, what do you do? You don't throw it out. You figure out ways to fix it. You approach the meditation as a craftsperson. When things aren't going well, the craftsperson says, well, what can we do to make it better? What can we do to compensate for mistakes in the past, and what do we do to make sure we don't repeat those mistakes? In other words, you let the whole process engage your imagination, engage your interest. So you can try to figure it out. At the same time, being circumspect about what you're doing. You try one solution, and it may be good for one purpose, but it's creates a problem someplace else, well, you learn how to make adjustments again. You use all your intelligence to get this to work. Now you notice these four qualities work together a lot, the desire and the intent in particular. If you don't want to do it, it's very hard to pay careful attention. If you're not paying careful attention, how can you figure out what's going right and what's going wrong? And when you figure something out, what does it mean unless you actually make an effort to make it better? So all four qualities work together. As I said earlier, it's simply a matter of which one you're going to emphasize. So it's good to keep these qualities in mind as you're sitting down to meditate, approaching it as a skill. And if things are not going well, ask yourself, which quality is missing? And how do you breathe? How do you talk to yourself? How do you adjust your perceptions so you can get things to go better? Because we are working toward a goal here. The goal is our happiness. The Buddha was not the sort of person to say you practice without a goal or without any gaining mind. He was very clear about the fact that we are trying to gain concentration, we are trying to gain discernment. He would often use images of investment. You invest your time, you invest your energy in things that will give a good return. So success is an issue. We are here because we do want to gain peace of mind. We want to gain a genuine happiness, a happiness that doesn't disappoint, a happiness that doesn't place any burdens on anybody, happiness that causes no harm to anyone. That's a noble goal. And so we should do our best to try to succeed at attaining it. 